All right, I think uh, I'm going to go ahead and convene us um, on behalf of the Center for Western Civilization, Thought, and Policy. Welcome. Uh, as uh, some of you know, I'm Stephen Presser, and I'm one of this year's two visiting scholars in conservative thought and policy. And in that capacity, I am deeply honored to introduce you to our speaker this evening, Gerald Rossello. Gerald is, simply stated, one of my very favorite humans. For many years, I've worked for him as a writer at the University of Bookman, now an online journal reviewing books on politics and culture. It is, if I may say so myself, <coughs> one of the most stimulating, intelligent, and informed websites you can visit. And that's all due to Gerald. But Gerald is not simply one of our most important preservers of our intellectual heritage. He's also a New York partner in one of our nation's most distinguished law firms that he won't let me mention. He carries on a tradition now almost completely lost, and that's the tradition of the working lawyer and man of letters. And for that, he has my undying admiration, and he should have yours as well. Gerald is himself a gifted writer and author. He has published or edited five books. His articles and reviews have appeared in the Hedgehog Review, the Wall Street Journal, American Affairs, Modern Age, the Literary Review, the Review of Politics, and several other scholarly and popular publications. Most important for our purposes tonight, he's one of the country's leading experts on the greatest conservative thinker of the 20th century, the intellectual force behind the political revival of the conservative movement, Russell Kirk. For those of you who are encountering Russell Kirk for the first time, you're in for a great treat. And your further assignment, as soon as you can, is to read Kirk's Conservative Mind, the best history of Anglo-American conservative thought available. The rest of us, though, are equally privileged and delighted to hear Gerald's talk tonight called Imagination Rules the World, Russell Kirk and Conservatism. So without further ado, Gerald Russell. Great. Thank, thank you, Stephen, for that gracious and completely unwarranted introduction. Uh, and thanks to the center and to the university for inviting me to speak tonight. Um, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to talk about one of my favorite writers and, and, and one I hope that will become one of your favorites as well. Um, as Stephen might mention, how many have read Russell Kirk coming into this room? Good, 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 good. Uh, so I'm going to provide a little bit of background for those of you who, uh, who have not had as great familiarity with him. Russell Kirk is called often a founder of American conservatism which becomes really identifiable in the late 1940s, early 1950s. And specifically, Kirk is often labeled as the founder or leader of the traditionalist wing or form of conservatism, which along with others like the anti-communists, the libertarians, the neoconservatives, make up a large part of the conservative movement, at least since the 1960s. But I want to break apart a little bit that term traditionalism and what that means in his work, because I think it's often misunderstood. And Kirk's conservatism is not easily identified among really what most of what passes for conservatism today. His is not really the conservatism of the Washington DC Beltway or the think tanks or the Republican Party or even of Wall Street. In a sense, as I'll hope to explain and show you, it's not really strictly political or economic at all if we see that simply in terms of elections or policies. And I think it's an important time in our nation's history to talk about Russell because to put it mildly, conservatism finds itself in something of an impasse. Um, to some, the recent election showed that conservatism was merely a cover for intolerance. To others, it was a demonstration that conservatives and conservatism has no real intellectual content. All the think tank papers and undergraduate seminars and centers like this, some liberals have claimed, are shown to be useless in the face of a populist wave that doesn't follow clear right-wing templates. And to still others, conservatives and conservatism has lost touch with actual voters, that what the voters wanted was not a tax program but a champion, not the language of creative destruction of capitalism but of community. 
And some of this, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the recent book, The Great Revolt by Selena Zito, talks about this, about what voters were looking for with, uh, leading up to the election of President Trump. Trump himself, uh, I think, you know, would be hard to identify some, but not all the attributes of a statesman. But he was able to break out of a liberal narrative in a way that might allow for a Kirkian conservatism, as I'll try to explain, to flourish a little bit. And there's a danger, of course, with breaking open that narrative that it might allow some uh, unpleasant or uh, less uh, attractive aspects of conservatism to emerge. Before I get to Russell, though, I want to maybe explain how I got here. Uh, I'm not an academic. I'm not a pundit. I'm not a think tanker. As Stephen said, I'm just a lawyer. Uh, but I, but I want to explain a little bit my own autobiography and how I came to Russell. Uh, I was born as far away from an intellectual environment as one can imagine in the 1970s and 80s in an ethnic enclave in New York City. Uh, and when I was in college, I set myself the task of reading The Conservative Mind. Uh, a bunch of us had gotten together and said, well, we're sort of right wing. What should we, what should we read? And after reading it that summer, I'd never, I discovered I never really read anything like that. It was evocative. It was, it, its prose was disciplined. It had a strong imaginative content and was really showed me that there were legitimate reasons for being a conservative and that there was a way to defend the culture and history of my community that I had come from that I really hadn't known existed. And recently, Jack Hunter, who some of you may know, wrote a piece for Modern Age where he makes the same point. He read The Conservative Mind in college, and he says that uh, the right now could use more of, quote, Kirk's basic compassion and respect for human diversity. And I think Kirk offers a way out of the dilemma that conservative, conservatism finds itself. Uh, and this year, 2018, is the centenary of Kirk's birth, and I think it's especially appropriate for us to talk about what her, Kirk has to offer. He writes that, I, have been in, I, Kirk, have been endeavoring to steer clear of bigotry, intolerance, eccentricity, and preoccupation with the hour's political controversies, the curses of American conservatives. And I think that's a, a message and a mission that the American right needs now as much as ever. So just to set the stage a little bit, the author of The Conservative Mind uh, perhaps doesn't meet the stereotype of a conservative. Uh, he was generally opposed to most of the military engagements the United States had fought in since World War II. Uh, he wrote ghost stories, uh, award-winning ones in fact, and appeared in, in anthologies along with Stephen King and Joyce Carol Oates. He spent his time planting thousands of trees in his native Michigan. He provided shelter in his home called Piety Hill to refugees from all over the world. I think he defies a lot of the stereotypes that at least some current members of the elite classes have of conservatives. And I think that he offers an alternative to that form of view. And that's why in his lifetime, Kirk had an audience not only among conservatives, but a respectful hearing among lots of liberal uh, commentators and pundits as well. So I want to do a couple of things today. First, I want to set out what makes the conservative mind such an important book for anyone interested in conservatism generally or uh, American intellectual history. Second, I want to touch a little bit on why Kirk, really more than anybody else who was writing in that first generation of conservatives, except maybe for William F. Buckley, can speak to what conservatives care or should care about today. And in this respect, I describe Kirk as a, quote, postmodern conservative, which may sound strange at first, but which I think can be used to address some of Kirk's themes, including the role that the imagination plays in his thought. And finally, if there's time, I want to explain a little bit about Kirk's notion of what he called the permanent things. And I'm happy to make this interactive rather than wait till the end. So if people have questions or if I'm speaking too fast or too confusingly, just let me know, please. But before we do any of that, uh, maybe a little background on Kirk is in order. So he was born, as I mentioned, 100 years ago in 1918 in a small Michigan town called Plymouth. He served in the military in World War II, and that was a central experience for him. His service was mostly in the far west. He didn't actually see combat, but it did two things for him. First. It gave him a lot of time to read, and he writes in his memoirs how important that was to him to sort of dig into lots of good books and figure out what, what he wanted to do and how, what he, how he wanted to think about things. And second, Kirk's time in the Army confirmed in him a distaste in bigness, in bigness in all its forms, big business, big military, big government, as really an enemy to a certain kind of individuality and, and community that, that he thought was really the constituent parts of a humane life. In 1944, for example, he rejected both Roosevelt and the Republicans, and he voted for Norman Thomas, the Socialist Party candidate. 
seeing in both of the major parties simply a vote for what he uh, considered a growing or incipient American empire. And over the course of his life, I'm not sure that there was any military uh, adventure that he supported, and his views remained fairly consistent. In 1976, for example, he, he was, spoke generously of Eugene McCarthy, whom some of you may recall as uh, not a conservative, <laughs> uh, but in many ways was part of that same Midwestern sensibility that Kirk had, uh, and he became well known in his later years for opposing the invasion of Iraq, uh, which roused the anger of some of the conservative establishment in that day. He was educated at Michigan State and Duke, and then at St. Andrews University in Scotland, and the doc uh, his doctoral dissertation became The Conservative Mind. And he wrote more than two dozen other books, hundreds of columns and essays, and he had especially a long-running column in National Review, where he was one of his first writers. Uh, he founded the journals Modern Age, as well as the University Bookman, which, as Stephen mentioned, I now edit. Uh, and his, he, his ghost stories, as I mentioned, were, were what he really wanted to do, uh, it is, uh, if it could make any money, as he writes in his letters. Uh, but he used his experience in the Michigan uh, uh, wilds and in his Scottish country houses that he visited as a student to be the source of a lot of these ghost stories, and, he, and as well as his family history in his house, which is called Piety Hill. His family were uh, spiritualists in the 19th century and had seances in that house, and for the rest of his life he was convinced, as some of his guests became convinced, that the house was haunted. And so a lot of the, uh, a lot of the stories have root in, it, uh, as Kirk would call, real experiences that he had in the house. The Conservative Mind. That was published in 1953, uh, and it was reviewed very, very widely. Time Magazine devoted its entire uh, review section to it when it came out. It was a very big splash. He was then a young professor, and he was acknowledged as a leading light of what was then called the New Conservatism which was distinguished from the somewhat sort of disjointed and disorganized members of the right of 1930s and 40s. And this came at the right time, right? The, the New Deal, of course, had been implemented throughout the 1930s and 40s. The Cold War was just settling in. And there were very few established conservative writers in America. Of course, there was no talk radio of, this, of the kind that we know. There was no internet, no Fox News. Uh, and until Kirk started founding them, really very few even important conservative journals. Liberalism seemed to be the wave of the future. And not only that, liberalism was thought to be the only intellectual tradition in America at all. As some of you may know the famous quote from Lionel Trilling in his book, The Liberal Imagination, which he wrote in 1950. He says, liberalism is not only the dominant, but even the sole intellectual tradition. For it is the plain fact that nowadays there are no conservative or reactionary ideas in general circulation. This does not mean, of course, that there's no impulse to conservatism or reaction. Such impulses are certainly very strong, perhaps even stronger than most of us know. But the conservative impulse and the reactionary impulse do not, with some isolated and some ecclesiastical exceptions, express themselves in ideas, but only in action or in the famous quote, irritable mental gestures which seek to resemble ideas. And this view was not new, a century before uh, John Stuart Mill had called conservatives the stupid party. And on this view, in the 50s in America, conservatism was really at home only in nations with a pre-modern hierarchical past, like those in Europe, or was an expression of what political scientist Richard Hofstadter called the paranoid style, right? There was really no substance to conservatism. In neither instance was it anything that Americans should be considering as a viable intellectual or political movement. And of course, the ideas expressed by Trilling have not ended in 1950. Uh, one doesn't need to look very far, even in contemporary news media, to know how conservatism is treated. But into this world, very unsympathetic towards conservatism, comes Kirk, with his walking stick and his old-fashioned uh, vest and his house in rural Michigan and his typewriter. Liberal, liberals were wrong in this assessment, he argued, and that conservatism was incoherent or lacked intellectual respectability. In the very first lines of the book, in fact, he addresses Mill's insulting phrase. Yes, he says, certainly very, very many dull and unreflecting people have lent their inertia to the cause of conservatism. But, he says, for the last two centuries, it has also been defended by men of learning and genius. And so contrary to Trilling, modern conservatism does have a tradition of ideas. In fact, it provides an entire outlook on how to regard the social order. It has a definable beginning, according to Kirk. Conservatism was born in opposition to the French Revolution. And it has a first book, Edmund Burke's Reflections on the Revolution in France. 
Drawing on that tradition, Kirk developed his famous principles of conservatism that he opens the conservative mind with. And the book has gone through several editions, and so the, the way Kirk words those principles varies from time to time. But generally, they include a belief in a transcendent order, an affection for the variety and mystery of the human condition, and a defense of custom and convention. And Ted, Ted McAllister, who's a really brilliant interpreter of Kirk, writes, Conservatives have an affection for variety and mystery. Conservatism is less ideology than aesthetics, less about beliefs than the imagination that orders those beliefs. Kirk understood this affection to be life-affirming, emerging out of an inherited and powerful vision about human nature and divine purpose. It is the love of a creature for the creation in which he or she participates and in the context of which they get their purpose. It is the joy of the spiritual outdoors, boundless, beautiful, and incomprehensible, rather than the delusion of a materialist paradise where the creature has become creator of a rather pinched world, which I think very nicely sums up uh, that principle of Kirk's. Kirk went on, Burke had admirers and those who carried his thought forward even in the United States. In The Conservative Mind, he has a bunch of chapters. He discusses people like John Adams, Nathaniel Hawthorne, Fisher Ames, that put Burkean principles into action in America. And he saw also coming up even into the present day with Irving Babbitt, George Santayana, and T.S. Eliot, whom we'll talk about a little bit later. For, the, for those of you who might be following up, uh, a particularly, particularly uh, well-known recent American play, he also had some words about Alexander Hamilton. Uh, he has some admiration for him, but he, but he finds the uses to which Hamilton put his genius somewhat wanting. I just needed to include this quote. He says, yet Alexander Hamilton, the financier, the party manager, the empire builder, fascinates those numerous Americans among whom the acquisitive instinct is confounded with the conservative tendency. Financier, party manager, and empire builder, just to be clear, are not terms of praise in Kirk's lexicon. Uh, and he thinks that they are often confused by people on the right. And Kirk begins with the French Revolution and Burke's response to it because the conflict between revolution and what Kirk called the politics of prescription enters into a new phase and has continued really up till today. The revolution was, was spurred by a disastrous ideology, right? That man is perfectible and that government, sometimes expressed variously as the will of the people, could make its citizens perfect, whether they liked it or not. And that anything that stands in the way of that government perfection needs to be discredited and destroyed. Everything needs to be uniform, everything equal. This, Kirk saw, was the way to the gulag, and as we might say now, the modern surveillance state. And ideologies have come and gone since then. Kirk names a bunch. Uh, there's uh, rationalism, scientism, the romantic emancipation of the bonds of family and tradition that he places that started with Rousseau, Marxism, and similar types of collectivism. Against each of these, Kirk said, conservatism is and must be opposed. For it does not reduce people or political society to rigid tests of ideological purity. Conservatism is itself pluralistic, uh, respecting diversity and variety, yet acknowledging limits to individual and social action. When Kirk was writing his book, some accused Burke, which is a typical criticism, of being simply a utilitarian. Don't conservatives just prefer what works? Uh, and no real objection to any set of social arrangements, just as long as it was efficient in some way. Kirk disagreed, and I think really changed the way people interpreted Burke and that tradition. Uh, for him, conservatism and the defense of custom was not a utilitarian calculus, but rather an argument that what had developed over centuries in a particular place, in a particular time, among a particular people, needed to be defended for its own sake, especially as it may reflect what Kirk uh, called the permanent things. And because of that, he was, the, he was a very big champion of what he called the principle of order. And one of his great books that he wrote about 20 years after the conservative mind is called The Roots of American Order. And he describes order as an anticipatory refutation of utilitarianism, positivism, and pragmatism. Society on this view is not a Lockean contract. We don't all get together and agree to the terms, but rather it's a sacred covenant among the dead, the living, and those yet to be born. And, it, and for that reason needed to be protected. We are tradition-making creatures wherever we are. We like to put down roots. Um, and so we will always try to establish some kind of order. The problem is oftentimes liberalism is the order of disruption and cannot create those roots. And order for Kirk, in a sense, is what makes all the other goods we enjoy possible. 
And to understand that order, you must understand the past. Kirk was not a political theorist or an economist. He was a historian, and that is how he tended to look at these issues. Uh, but he didn't want to understand the past in sort of a solely empirical or dryly academic way. He was more concerned with creating a story that we can inhabit so that we can understand who we are by where we came from. And this is not meant to be a congratulatory or um, view of Western history that erases the faults and sins of the past. He was very much aware that not all of our past is admirable or worthy of emulation. And he was not a reactionary in that sense. He did not really seek to go backward. But the point is that it is our past, something that we live with regardless of our attitude towards it. So Burke's book sets out this first compelling case that Kirk picks up. And Burke and Kirk tend to say that these principles are reflected in some kind of a natural law. And as I said, I'm not, uh, certainly not the legal scholar Stephen is, and I'm not a philosopher. I don't want to get too much into the intricacies of natural law thinking, but for Kirk's view, I think it's worth making a couple of points. He did believe in enduring moral norms, but he did not believe that a social code or a legal code could reduce those norms into some kind of um, prohibitory or permissive uh, set of legal principles or social or acts or uh, social requirements. Natural law can be discovered through the use of reason, but its application is always subject to prudence and humanity's fallible nature. He was very reluctant to uh, impose, even when he thought the natural law requirements or, or enduring moral principles were clear, he was very sensitive to our uh, tendency towards domination uh, or uh, uh, sinfulness, is what he would say, that would tend to warp even those requirements. So he was always, he believed in it, but was very careful as to when it would be required. He didn't think that those kind of virtues could be imposed from above, and rather they must be exemplified in individuals and in communities and in practices that can su support their growth. And how this gets reflected in his writing, I'll get to in a little bit. Uh, the collectivism that Kirk opposed, some of you may have seen this, had a modest renaissance for people calling themselves socialists. Uh, in my na native state of New York, we just elected one to Congress. Uh, and uh, Kirk's arguments, however, to socialism remain the same. To reduce persons to economic units was to deny their humanity, and it would lead to tyranny. And that was a risk of economic ideologies of the left or the right. He saw, he saw something equivalent in the right wing uh, or libertarian elevation of the free market abstracted from any other kind of uh, social practice. Around, you know, and so he combines that with the danger of a radical individualism, which we see really in our current politics. This radical individualism contends that society must bend itself to my own view of myself, that I have a right to have government or others intercede for me to satisfy my wants. But as Kirk wrote, wants are tricky things and too easily spill over into a multitude of rights. And once you get to the problem of balancing those rights one against the other, that would require more governmental action, which tends to create not really a more harmonious society, but really one that's riven by winners and losers as to who can persuade the government whose rights matter more. Conservatism is and must be more than, than, uh, than this, and it must be more than simply a rejection of ideology. A common objection that one often heard in Kirk's day as well as now is that Conservatism really has no positive program, that we're the party of no, right? We don't like things, we want things to stay the same, we want to reject any kind of innovation. I don't think that's the case. I don't think Kirk did either. Uh, in fact, after uh, he was challenged, after the conservative mind came out to write a book about a program, and he came out with a book called A Program for Conservatives, which typically with Kirk had no actual political recommendations in it, but really sort of how to structure uh, thinking about human society. He has chapters in there like a question, a question on power, a question on justice, a question on equality. Uh, and Kirk sets out, in the, in, even in the conservative mind, this kind of alternative. Uh, David Frum, whom some of you may be familiar with, not a fan of Kirk, generally, uh, wrote that Kirk did not so much um, discover a conservative tradition in the conservative mind so much as he created one. And that, I think, is part of his continuing appeal. Kirk, Kirk's conservatism is not really, uh, as I explained this to, to some of the fellows at lunch, is not really so much an opposition to liberalism, which is how it's often portrayed. 
it's really a completely, he's doing something completely different as a, creating an alternative to liberalism. And a lot of conservatives misread him because they try and look for refutations of particular liberal points, which are there, but he's really engaged in another project. Uh, he was really was looking forward, not backward. And in do, doing some research, as, as uh, Stephen mentioned, I've written a fair amount of Russell. I wrote a book uh, where I characterized him as having a postmodern imagination. And I've, made, I've given this, this uh, definition of several times at uh, some other conservative gatherings, and I always get a little postmodern conservatives. Isn't that just a code word, right, for political correctness and multiculturalism and moral relativism? Well, yes, it can be, right? Uh, and conservatives often use that term to describe what they don't like uh, about contemporary intellectual life. And they're not completely wrong. There's a lot of flim flammery involved with that term. Uh, and there's even a lot of talk these days that the word postmodern is outmoded. We've gone so far beyond the modern age that we've gone beyond the postmodern age as well. But there's more to it than that, at least I'm going to argue. Uh, and I think that the idea of a postmodernity provides some insight into what I think Kirk was doing. In doing research for writing this book, um, I, I researched what, when the word postmodern started. And it was written long before it was adopted by academics or by European intellectuals. It was, in fact, used in 1926 for the first time by Bernard Innings Bell. Does anyone know who Bernard Innings Bell is? Right. Uh, he was a conservative Episcopalian clergyman who wrote a book about that title, on that title. Bell was an influence on Kirk. Uh, who credited Bell for introducing him, Kirk, to the writings of Albert J. Nock and others. And Bell, Bell wrote another book called Crowd Culture uh, in 1952, which I highly recommend. It's been recently republished by ISI. Uh, but B Bell's postmodernism was not the postmodernism you might expect. Bell was a Christian, and he was addressing the loss of faith in the West. He argued that liberalism had come to a crossroads. And this is in 1926. He argues that since the modern person has no infallible Bible, he wrote, there was no authoritative scripture and no magisterial tradition based on that scripture. The liberal can only turn the, to the authority of their own mind to make value judgments. And he combined that at the same time with the rise of science. And to compress the argument a little bit, the individual intellect, according to Bell, under liberalism, could now discern for himself or herself those immutable laws of nature which become the new scripture. So you have an autonomous individual and the supposed uh, authority of science, not just for physical reality, but for moral and social reality as well. And this is what Bell called scientism, the notion that the methods of scientific measurement can divine the truths about humanity as they can of physical processes. But Bell recognized the limits of scientific knowledge. It could sometimes answer the how, but never the why if something happened. And he thought that this line of thinking was a dead end. He wrote, modernism has ceased to be modern, we are ready now for some sort of postmodernism. I'm sure he would be surprised by the direction that postmodernism took in the 70s and 80s, but his postmodernism was characterized by a renewed faith uh, in the individual conscience and in the enduring norms of reality. And Kirk, I'm not sure if he ever read that book in particular, but he certainly took these themes from Bell. The first was a recognition of the limits of scientific knowledge and indeed human knowledge more generally. Life at its core, according to Kirk, is a mystery in the hands of divine providence, and therefore we must be respectful of boundaries and also of the irreducible value of each individual human person, which can't be manipulated or engineered like a material object. He, was, he wrote many, many essays against social engineers and social planning for exactly that reason. Science, too, can be an ideology, and one used to replace true inquiry with manipulation and trust in supposed experts. And Kirk thought that scientism reduced us to a materialist straitjacket that denied the ability of the imagination to break through. In fact, he thought that science at its best also uses the imagination. And he has a great, later on in his life, he became very influenced by a historian named John Lukacs, whom I also recommend, who himself was influenced by Werner Heisenberg. And uh, Lukacs' view was that uh, Heisenberg was as much a philosopher as a scientist, and that uh, he was one who, uh, or that quantum physics in particular, was as imaginative as any humane discipline, but it was not scientism. And the second point that Kirk adopts was a sense that liberalism was over. Kirk was already referring in 1953 to the disintegration of liberal ideals. And in the, in the 1950s, Kirk writes this. We live then in an insecure society 
doubtful of its future, an island of com comparative but perilous sanctuary in a sea of revolution. And neither the old isolation nor the old received opinions of the mass of men seem likely to hold against the physical force of revolutionary powers and the moral innovations of ideology. This is just such a time as commonly has required and produced, in the course of history, a re-examination of first principles and a considered political philosophy. I don't think those are the words of a reactionary, and they're also written in the 1950s, which is sort of caricatured as this era of placidity and, and consensus. And in an earlier essay around this time, in the mid-1950s, called The Dissolution of Liberalism, Kirk concluded that liberalism was moribund from the beginning for lack of a higher imagination. Because it lacked any real narrative power, it could not maintain a hold on the popular imagination for long. Liberalism, he writes, soon, quote, ceased to signify anything, even among its most sincere partisans, other than a vague goodwill. And I think you've seen, you, we were talking about, again a little bit about this at lunch. What you see now is with the growth of identity politics and others, you really see that coming to fruition. That liberalism is coming to the end of whatever imaginative reach it had. People are looking for other stories to attach themselves to. And although written in the 1950s, uh, Kirk's essay anticipates subsequent scholarly writing about the content and future of liberalism, the most recent of which, if any of you have read Patrick Deneen's book about the failure of liberalism. And in that sense, I would argue Kirk did have a postmodern imagination, not a reactionary one. Even in 1982, after Reagan was elected for the first time, he's writing things like this. The postmodern imagination stands ready to be captured, and the seemingly novel ideas and sentiments and modes may turn out, after all, to be received truths and in institutions well known to surviving conservatives. Surviving, that is, surviving liberalism by doing something else, by thinking in a different way. In fact, he writes, it may be the conservative imagination which is to guide the postmodern age. And there's a political theorist um, up at uh, SUNY Albany, Robert Heinemann, who wrote, who wrote this about the conservative turn towards postmodernism. Like the traditionalist conservative, the postmodern thinker has serious doubts about the rationalist Anglo-American tradition that undergirds much of social science. However, in rejecting this tradition, the postmodernist consciously tries to avoid any kind of totalizing ordered explanation while the conservative searches for a broader, deeper concept of rationality that encompasses the actual behavior and beliefs of real people. So Kirk shared a postmodern distaste for totalizing narratives, sort of the, the, this is the way the world is working, the end of history, or the arc of history bends towards whatever. Uh, he saw in that really a totalitarian danger. But he did try and broaden that concept of rationality by trying to ground it in the historical practices and customs of actual people. And there are two essays that I want to talk to you about that he wrote, one called The Age of Discussion and one called The Age of Sentiment. The Age of Discussion, he writes, was dominated by the word, by rational argument. But it was giving way to the age of sentiment, which is dominated by the image. And he places the, the, the age of discussion in those great 19th century learned journals of heavy text and uh, pretty confident assumptions about progress and humanity. Uh, and he writes that discussion creates democracy, it creates this kind of uh, assumption that there's a rational pool that we all can uh, participate in and come to a considered judgment. And, both, and it revolves around the premise that through discourse, political and social problems could be solved. And Kirk loved that era. I mean, you, he, he loved reading those, eight, those 19th and 19th century British periodicals. That's how he writes in certain, in certain sense. But he was no really lover of that age of discussion, which he calls, for the most part, it was an age of sham and posturing. And he writes, the age of sentiment begins with movies and television. Into the age of sentiment, he writes, there will survive some serious periodicals and some decent books, yet this remnant of genuine thinkers and talkers may be very small. The immense majority of human beings will feel with the projected images they behold upon the television screen. And in those viewers, that screen will rouse sentiment rather than reflection. Waves of emotion will sweep back and forth so long as the age of sentiment endures. And whether those emotions are low or high must depend upon the folk who determine the tone and temper of the programming. So uh, the age of discussion, in a, in a way of, another way of putting it, embodied perhaps what was called the cult of the fact. A fact by itself doesn't mean anything. Only by association with other facts can we assume meaning and bring the underlying, what Lukács calls the event, to light. And what Kirk is saying is that the way we used to do that through the word uh, has now uh, been effaced by the image. And so conservatives need to capture the image. We need to capture it with the use of our historical uh, and moral imaginations.
So history doesn't move, according to Kirk, into some, forward into some sort of utopia where we're going to be changed into perfect humans. The end of liberalism, Kirk argued, will allow us to see ourselves as we really are, not as autonomous units, not as uh, sort of ghostly entities in a machine, uh, imper but what we are are imperfect creatures seeking the transcendent. Peter Lawler, whom some, I don't know if, if any of you know his work, um, he's recently deceased professor, he wrote a book called Postmodernism Rightly Understood. And he argued that postmodernism is a human reflection on the failure of the modern project to eradicate human mystery and to bring history to an end. And in some forms, postmodernism is close to mystery. Every, I don't know if you guys have read some of postmodern works, everything's a joke and it's just a pastiche of other traditions that we all sort of piece together without any real seriousness. That's one way of looking at it. Kirk saw that, in fact, it was a way to open ourselves up to mystery. And he wrote that the age of discussion was re reserved only for a few. Most were content to follow the doctrines of one faction or another. And he writes, an age moved by high sentiment can be more admirable than an age mired in desiccated discussion. So I, don't, I would argue that those are not the words of a reactionary elitist, but as someone trying to grasp an authentic populism. And that brings us back to the conservative mind. One of the things that's exasperated a lot of readers is that, if, and for those of you who've read this book, uh, is Kirk's style in the conservative mind and in other books. It's sort of discursive, it's evocative, it's not terribly analytical if you really try and rip it apart. And as I mentioned before, it doesn't really lay out any party platform. He uses a lot of individual examples, a lot of biography, and some thought that this was a form of intellectual laziness. I, I was listening to a talk a couple of weeks ago by a very prominent conservative thinker who called Kirk's writing cobwebby, which to me it's the farthest thing from. But it gives that sort of, some, some people has that sort of flavor. But I think he was doing something different. He was intentionally waging this war of the imagination, but he needed a different way of doing it. He couldn't write like the liberals write. He couldn't write about rights. He couldn't write about efficiency. He couldn't write about the free market in the way that he wanted to in order to create this imaginative space. Uh, and to, to, to state outright the traditions one wants to preserve according to logical premises is a losing argument. It's insufficient. It, it, it buys into the very liberal premises Kirk was writing against. So, for example, the first words in, his, in the conservative mind, among the very first, he says he wrote it was written at Haunted St. Andrews and in the old country houses of Fife. He's sort of putting you right there into the picture, right? Um, he concentrated on the formation of those images, really to the, almost to the detriment of logical argument, for whether, as he writes, whether to throw away yesterday's nonsense to embrace tomorrow's nonsense, or whether we find our way out of superficiality to real meaning, must depend upon the images we discover and shape. And that's what he was trying to do, to, sh to create those images. And just a couple of minutes, and then maybe we'll, we'll, we'll finish up on, on the moral imagination, uh, which Kirk writes. Kirk, as I said, was afraid of totalizing anything. And he often wrote that history is not an armed doctrine. You can't use it as a weapon in the present. But you can use it to form what he called the moral imagination, which he gets from Burke. Uh, he describes it as, a power of ethical perception which strides beyond the barriers of private experience and momentary events. It is the moral imagination which informs us concerning the dignity of human nature, which instructs us that we are more than naked apes. And Burke wrote in a very famous passage in Reflections on the Revolution in France that the moral ima imagination is something that the heart owns and the understanding ratifies as necessary to cover the defects of our shivering nature and to raise it to dignity in our own estimation. It's an aesthetic and emotional imagination. It's grasped through the heart first, and only later ratified through our logical and understanding and reason. And that's why Kirk champions writers like T.S. Eliot, Flannery O'Connor, Ray Bradbury, as writers whose work embodies this moral imagination, creating images that we can then use, some of admiration, some of repulsion, but, ne but all of which are necessary to show us enduring truths. The moral imagination is like a series of roads it's built by others long before us to a series of destinations along which we can walk and from whose hard work we benefit. And I hope, I think I've uh, shown, I think that the imagination for Kirk is not primarily a political tool, right? Uh, each must seek to educa educate their own moral imagination. David Bromwich, who's a scholar of Burke, again, no friend to Kirk, writes, the moral imagination is as much about the kind of person I am to be as it is the question of who we shall be together, which I think is also very conducive to what Kirk was trying to do. It creates a common space where we can work together. It is, and as Bromwich states, and he wrote, wrote this before the hashtag, a source of resistance. 
the person who sees himself as both doer and object, who asks what a given act is doing to oneself as well as one's neighbors, is less prey to an imagination uh, heated by proselytism and war. I think that is very much a Kirkian thought. Kirk uh, contrasted the moral imagination to what he called the diabolical imagination, which tended to drag us away from reality into fantasy, into propaganda. And I think this, that, that's a similar theme to what, um, what Bromwich is saying here. And to come back to his image of himself, if you've ever seen pictures of Kirk, he's always pictured in sort of a waistcoat and he has this walking stick that has actually a sort of a sword inside of it and he has this sort of weird hat. And he's doing that, people would, would tease about that saying, he's a throwback, right? He's not serious, he's not seriously doing anything. But, and he'd invite all these sort of strange characters up to his house and they would sort of, he had, would dress up on Halloween as sort of ghosts, he'd tell ghost stories. He seems so far afield from anything that was you know, really important in Washington or really important in New York. I, I think all of that he was sincere, but it also was very much a part of self-creation. He was envisioning the kind of life that he wanted to live in a humane way and showing us that it was possible. Do we have a few more minutes? Absolutely. All right. Uh, so I'm going to close you know, uh, with what he called the permanent things. So uh, for Kirk, the permanent things were those uh, enduring truths of human existence. He said there are certain permanent things in society, the health of the family, inherited political institutions that ensure a measure of order and justice and freedom, a life of diversity and independence, and a life marked by widespread possession of, of private property. These permanent things guarantee against arbitrary interference by the state or by the market. But they do more than this. Quoting Eliot, Kirk wrote that these permanent things were those elements in the human condition that give us our nature, without which we are as the beasts that perish. And this is what gets reflected through his imaginative work, I would argue. How are those things supposed to work in real life? And he goes through what those permanent things are reflected in the United States. He refers to the Christian bases, of, for example, of the common law. Uh, he talks about British political precedent as sort of the uh, guideposts and the bases of our American order. Uh, Stephen knows much more about that than I, but he does argue that, that those kinds of bases inhibit in, in, the, in, in the context I'm thinking of, sort of judicial arbitrariness, right? Uh, some of you may have read that we had a new Supreme Court justice recently, where, <laughs> where a lot of the discussion really was about how much power are we giving these uh, nine justices? And uh, Kirk, I think, would write that part of the reason why, we, why this discussion is becoming so vicious is because we've lacked any sense of what the roots are of our uh, judicial system, what our political system is. Um, and we need those roots because, as he quoted once Hannah Arendt, the rootless are violent. Uh, and without recognition that we are members and beneficiaries of an order we did not create, violence can erupt in our politics, which I think we see both on the left and the right in recent years. These are people without, uh, maybe through no fault of their own, without an understanding of who they are and where they came from. Uh, and Kirk wrote a lot about this in the 60s where there was a similar era of violence. But these political arrangements are not enough. I think it's, it's obvious that Kirk was thinking about something else, and he refers a lot to what he called the unwritten constitution, which is a term he gets from Arrestus Bronson. Has anyone heard of Arrestus Bronson? Yeah. Crucial American thinker, really the, mo the, the most important American political thinker of the 19th century, easily. Uh, and Kirk uh, discovered a lot of his work. The unwritten constitution is everything else, everything else that supports the written constitution. Uh, and he said, no matter how, uh, Kirk said, no matter how admirable a constitution may look upon paper, it will be ineffectual unless the written constitution, the web of custom and convention, affirms an enduring moral order of obligation and personal responsibility. And some of you may remember in the 1980s and 70s, people would point to liberals or, or, or maybe liberal sympathizers would point to the constitution of like East Germany or the Soviet Union and say, look, it has all these really great guarantees of rights and guarantees of prosperity. What could be wrong with it? And conservatives always say, well, wait a minute, what's underneath all that? And what's underneath it for Kirk is the unwritten constitution. Kirk never, uh, at least so far as I'm aware in his work, lays out in particular what those unwritten customs and conventions might be. I think, again, part of that was deliberate. He did really disliked totalizing anything. It was each particular community has its own customs and traditions. T.S. Eliot, in one of his books, I think Notes on a Christian Culture, lists out all the common sort of symbols and traditions that every um, every uh, British subject would be expected to know. We don't, he, Kirk doesn't really do anything like that. I think some of us um, have tried. It's really our, maybe the next generation's task to do. But it wasn't reactionary necessarily. At the end of the conservative mind, he starts with Burke and he ends with T.S. Eliot. Uh, 
uh, about whom I've, I've talked. He wrote a separate book on Eliot, which I highly recommend. Eliot was a revolutionary in terms of poetic terms, right? He broke through uh, that literature that had gone stale and opened a window on a new way of looking at reality. So Kirk was no mere defender of the old and musty. He did try and champion people that he saw doing something different. Flannery O'Connor was the same way. He actually introduced Flannery O'Connor to Eliot. Eliot didn't like her prose so much. <laughs> uh, but he saw in them both, the, both uh, ways of looking at the moral order. And this way of... of defending the unwritten constitution is not really necessarily going to deliver clear political rewards. Um, and Kirk, uh, sort of along the lines I was saying before, said, I have not the slightest idea of what the American way of life in the abstract may be. He just did not think that, uh, certainly did not think it was something that could be packaged and exported to other countries. It was too nuanced, too much of ours really to be, uh, to be uh, packaged up like that. Conservatives need to foster and create those particulars in our own communities and in our own individual stories. Uh, they can protect us against the brutal uniformity of ideology, and really no matter who's in the White House or who is in Congress. And I'd refer you to the works of Bill Kaufman, some of you may know, who's written a whole series of books about Batavia, New York, uh, and, and the legends and heroes of Batavia, uh, as a model really to do, to do for our own communities what he has done for the community in which he grew up. Uh, when he was writing The Roots of American Order, he, Kirk in one of his letters says, in general, my approach is historical. Yet I'm concerned not with civilization in general, but rather with the institutions and beliefs which underlie the American personal and social order. And Ted McAllister again describes this as a mythopoetical account of our past. It's an attempt to tell a story that would be compelling and truthful and would win over our affections. And this is because for Kirk, political problems are inevitably philosophical and theological problems. Uh, and he, uh, he looked to an age that he wrote that may also be a time of renewed poetic imagination and the reflection of poetry in our common life, a vision of the splendor and misery of the human condition. That really is his conservatism. Uh, he stresses the transcendent and the limits this places on the political order. So yes, you can go use your moral imagination, you get glimpses of the transcendent, but again, you can't create heaven on earth. Uh, Ralph Hancock, who's another writer on Kirk, says that reason must confront the problematic articulations of transcendence generated in man's practical existence. Reason will have to learn to show the connections between the indefinable freedom of the human spirit and the humbler necessities of our natures. And that is, in fact, what Kirk was trying to do. Uh, Kirk value... Kirk valued family and community, and he recognized that the glimpses of the transcendent afforded by the use of the imagination modify and guide our reasoning and must form the basis, really, he thought, of the conservative temperament. Thank you. We have time for some questions. Hi, thanks so much for your time. Yeah. So, and two related questions. Is, what sense of the word liberalism is being used? So when you mentioned the Patrick Neen book, I took it that he's addressing liberalism as in like in the classical sense, beginning at John Locke and going through Mill, et cetera. But then at points it seemed like you were referring to liberalism as just the American political lap. So I'm just curious which of those senses you're intending. And then just the follow-up to that is liberalism in the kind of classical political sense, which includes you know everyone from Locke to Rawls, is conservatism, in that sense, a liberal view? Uh, both good questions. I was going to answer your first question. Kirk typically uses the word liberalism as shorthand for the autonomous individual separated out from tradition, family, community, religion. He, he associates that with different people at different times. So at times he'll associate it with Mill, saying that if you are this uh, utilitarian calculus person, you won't want what you want, and if there are society should be ordered among the aggregation of individual wants. Sometimes he associates it with Rousseau and kind of this romanticism on breaking the bonds of tradition. But for him, it's, uh, and sometimes he uses it for, uh, in a political sense, as collectivism, right? Big, big government, big regulation, uh, as a way to uh, control inefficiency of the market or social mores. But I think he's, in general, I think he comes close to what Patrick Deneen is doing because he says, in a lot of ways, what liberalism is doing sometimes conservatives agree with, right? And so the liberal, the liberal um, view of the human person sometimes is also reflected in a lot of conservative thought as somehow uh, autonomous in a way that Kirk was not um, 
not supportive of. To answer your second question, uh, which, uh, which I think was most conservatism, sort of a liberalism itself, I think, again, I think that Kirk anticipates a lot of what Deneen says. I think he would say, yes, a lot of what passes for conservatism in America is actually liberalism. Uh, and what he was trying to do in some of his work is really create something different, um, a different model, right? Someone who's really deeply embedded in community, who's really not focused on politics, uh, who understands the limits of the free market. Uh, that has gotten more or less purchase over the years, especially since he died, but that's kind of where it's coming from. You spoke to Kirk's view that um, a, ethics is necessary to inform a political philosophy. And uh, what I'm searching for is trying to nail down, and maybe you said it and I missed it, and so I apologize. Does he uh, believe in some kind of objective moral principles, to those five things that you referred to? Are those as so rock solid as anything gets in his world? They are. I mean, uh, he's, uh, he, he uh, I would divide up the way he's thinking about this in two stages. So for most of his life, he was sort of a, uh, an unaffiliated, uh, generic Christian. His family, as I said, were spiritualists. They were sort of uh, not particularly affiliated. He later on, uh, as an adult, after his marriage, converts to Christianity, or becomes a more formally Christian. Uh, but even so, he doesn't get much more tight than that. He believes in a transcendent moral order, for sure. That's consistent. He believes we have obligations to one another and to our ancestors and descendants. Uh, but he's consistently reluctant to then play out what that means. And part of it is he's not a philosopher. Part of it is, he, frankly, I don't think he was very interested in that kind of logical system. Uh, and so when he talks about uh, conservative affection for diversity and variety, or when he talks about the necessity of every side in society to have classes and orders, people would then jump on him and say, aha, all that means is you want elites, and you're a supportive of the elites, and you're not uh, you know, supportive of the common person, or uh, what that means is you're just in favor of the wealthy or what have you. And he would reject that, but he, uh, you know, either stubbornness or, you know, admirable bravery, however you want to look at it. He never went back and said, no, 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 what I mean is this. <laughs> uh, instead, what he would do is he would tell a story about him being justice of the peace in his small town in Michigan and how he interacted with various disputes. Uh, it's almost like in parable. Thank you, Zephyr. Yeah, yeah. It's... Uh, that's most of what I think when you actually try to nail them down on those on those kinds of things. Basically, read the book, and I will do it. Yeah, <laughs> you should. You should. Uh, yeah, in the back. Um, I wonder uh, if you could say uh, anything about his uh, Kirk's relationship, uh, personal or intellectual, with uh, with William F. Buckley, since they were quite contemporaneous. Did they? basically agree on uh, the fundamentals of conservatism? Did they have any disagreements? Uh, I would say yes, they had some disagreements. I think so. So Buckley famously traveled to Macosta to get Kirk to write for National Review as he was forming it, because he knew that having Kirk would be a very big boom, because he was, he was then the bigger name. I think God and Man at Yale, that Buckley had written, was just coming out, but the conservative mind had been out before, and Kirk was a better name. Kirk agreed to write a column called From the Academy on education. T.S. Eliot advised against him writing for National Review because he says it was being run by a bunch of college sophomores. <laughs> uh, and it was too sort of, you know, undergraduate. Uh, but Kirk, you know, was a working writer, among other things, and <laughs> needed, needed a regular column. Um, and so wrote, but he refused to be put on the masthead. Uh, and, uh, and as well, as he'd done a, in a couple of other magazines as well. Uh, and so I think that, that they both shared a particular conservative sensibility. I think that over time, um, Kirk and Buckley uh, split apart on some uh, political issues like the war in Iraq and others, but also I think more fundamentally, I think for Kirk, Buckley was probably too much of a libertarian, especially as he got to be later in life. And Buckley in turn thought Kirk was maybe sort of too sort of up in his Michigan fastness and not, you know, uh, being the wizard of Macosta and not really too engaged in, in political life. But, uh, but from, from his letters, you, which just came out, there's an edition of his letters that was just published, you can tell that they were friendly throughout their adult lives. And, and as Buckley retired from National Review, Kirk wrote a very nice letter to Buckley crediting him as that being his great legacy of revivifying conservatives um, in the 50s through that magazine. 
but I don't think they would have agreed on all points. Um, and I think, um, I mean, on a political level, yes, they have this sort of libertarian traditionalist divide. They both generally are supportive of a gold war, they both generally are supportive of Reagan. So on a political level, they have found a lot to agree on. I think personality-wise, they had their ups and downs. So I'm wondering, what would you say is uh, Kirk's most original um, argument? Or in particular, like, what, what is most distinctive of him as opposed to Burke? Because a lot of this sounds like, well, uh, Burke walked over. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that, that Kirk would, would probably be happy to have not had an original argument. So I think that one would be known for him. I think that his, his great contribution, I think, uh, at least to me, uh, in reading his work, is that uh, he does uh, show, let's show me sort of the, and some of this is derivative from Burke, clearly, the importance of the imagination in common life. That's, that's his contribution, I think, to conservative thought, that uh, you need to really uh, inhabit the past, you need to understand it sympathetically uh, in order for us to understand the transcendent, which is what he, sort of where he ends up going or wants to go. He does derive a lot of that from Burke. Uh, he derives a lot of that from Irving Babbitt, who's a Harvard professor in the, in the teens and 20s. Um, if you read those two, if you read Democracy and Leadership by Babbitt, A Reflection of the Revolution in France, you get a lot of where Kirk is going. Um, and I think he just continues that up into the present using other examples. So The Conservative Mind is a book of Burkean examples. The Roots of American Order is a history of four cities, right? Rome, Athens, Jerusalem, London, Philadelphia, five cities getting to the United States. And those are imaginative tropes that I think are in advance, perhaps, of what, Kirk, of what Burke was doing, but they're very much in that vein. So um, Kirk seems to think I was at Burke, but <laughs> so uh, Kirk seems, uh, he talks a lot about transcendent truths and, and other things that just kind of exist that aren't known by um, the intellect or, or reason. Um, you know, they're just kind of a part of who humans are. Um, and so, of course, that means that, that anything that, that comes to mind or, or what we do is, is all driven by that. So it's something that's, that's permanent in every human everywhere. Um, I guess the question I have um, because of that is, it seems to me like if you think of America in particular, you have a bunch of people who think that individuals drive um, thought, which seems to me like a, a direct contradiction to Burke, that how could they even think that um, if it was true that the family and these other communal truths, if it, if it wasn't the world being bended towards the individual, but instead they're being bended towards the community. So I'm just wondering how, or how would, how would uh, Kirk explain that, that same discrepancy? Between, I'm sorry, between? Between the existing people who, who don't seem to be acting according to these permanent truths. So. Right. Well, I, I think he probably has a, uh, a philosophical argument and later on a theological argument. Right? His philosophical argument or historical argument is that uh, uh, that people somehow sometimes embrace the order of disruption. Right? They embrace this idea that uh, individuals could be autonomous and self-create. I think he would say that that's historically inaccurate because no one is born abstract. We all come from somewhere. We all come from some set of relationships. And even if we choose to reject them, we're not doing it in, in a vacuum. I think theologically he would say, you know, frankly, after he became a Christian, he'd say that's, you know, if you're choosing yourself over others, if you're engaging in this sort of endless self-creation, you're engaging in a transgression of the theological virtues, right? You're not engaging in sort of a charity or being somehow prideful or something. But I think the, the more uh, historical argument that he made really throughout his whole life, but certainly in, in the early part, is that uh, those people in part are just mistaken, that they're, they're that the, the myth of an indivi of individualism is simply that it's a myth. We can't escape our circumstances, and so the, our our choice is how we relate to it. Is how I think how we would say. It. Can I ask a follow up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is not something. Not a moderator. <laughs> uh, so so I guess if some of us are mistaken and some of us aren't, uh, and we can't find out intellectually what these what we're mistaken in, right? We need right. days or whatever. How is it that we know when we're mistaken and can tell when even ourselves are mistaken or someone else? I don't, I don't, think, I don't think he would be that anti-intellectual, right? So I think what he would say is that there are certain goods of human existence that we can look at historically that favored human flourishing and happiness and some that didn't. So, you know, war, for example, generally is not even, even granting sort of uh, reasons to have it generally cause a lot of destruction. And so you'd want to limit 
needless war as much as possible, because historically that doesn't help society, whereas peace might. Uh, uh, organizing economies around essential authority generally is not fruitful for the people subject to them. Organizing economies in a relatively freer way is historically more beneficial for the individuals. So he would say you would need to look at, at it historically, and that is an intellectual and rational exercise. I think what Kirk would say is it's hard without uh, someone appreciating the goods that those things provide, it's hard to convince someone in the abstract, right? Because you have a lot of you know, communists and socialists now who are claiming despite uh, you know, the evidence that we should maybe try it uh, or try something like that. And so he, I think he would say that there's a clear end to logical argument, end in the sense of it can't go much further that you have to either live those, uh, uh, those other kinds of, of experiences or try to historically inhabit them in order to understand them. Yeah, I, I can't help but ask you a question of the, about how, the, how its effect may exist today. Assuming, assuming that parts of the Republican Party do have serious thinkers, with serious ideas that are tied to some intellectual background. For the sake of discussion, we'll accept that. <laughs> and, uh, do you see any contemporary what, politicians or conservative thinkers or influencers of contemporary policy and issues that are tied back to Kirk? And how are their ideas or their arguments reflected? Uh, well, I'm not sure how closely tied to Kirk, but certainly influential conservative thinkers. You have you know, the moderator right here, who's certainly one of them. Um, yeah, tied to which ideas that I should add. Yeah, I mean, you look at someone like Dan McCarthy, uh, who's the editor, uh, who was the editor of the American Conservative and now runs the Novak program for young uh, conservative journalists. His thought has a lot of Kirk in it. Uh, and he's a very influential person in D.C. and elsewhere. And he's been trying to expand out this kind of non- uh, what he, I, mean, I don't know, I don't know what words it enough, but, but a, a, an alternative to sort of standard republicanism and also neoconservatism that's very much based on a Kirkian understanding of political society. So I would look to him for sure. Ted McAllister is another one. Bruce Fronin is a, a law professor uh, in Ohio is another one who's written a series of books that, uh, on the Constitution and others that really lay out a very Kirkian program uh, of constitutional interpretation. So I would start with those three. I, I, yeah. I'd actually say that one could make an argument that the president is groping toward yeah. Kirkianism. Yeah. You know, I think that's right. I mean, I, in, that, what, in what sense? <laughs> that's <laughs> well, what's that? Go ahead. Well, I, I, I'll let you uh, take a stab at it. But I mean, the kind of ideas that you're talking about and the, the sense of the past and the rejection of abstract systems. Um, very Burkean, also very Kirkian. And mm -hmm. he's advised. I mean, picking the judges from the Federalist Society is a second-hand way of getting at what Mr. Kirk's all about. Yeah, no, I think that's right. I think that, 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 uh, that as I try to say at the open, the great advantage of the, the current presidency is that he that it, for, you know, some might say in better words, he broke both narratives. He broke the Republican narrative of how we win elections or how we should govern or that we'll be the, a minority party. And he broke the liberal narrative that we're the party of the future and everyone is going to vote for us and it's just a natural wave of, of progress. So how much of that he's, I think he's may perhaps absorb more of that as you know, a year, year and a half in. But regardless, he, he's allowed other people to fill in that space in a way that perhaps Republican politics hadn't let them in the previous administration. So a credit to imagination. I'm sorry? A credit to imagination. Yeah, perhaps of a kind, yeah. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, I was really interested in the discussion of um, postmodernism, and I wanted to pursue that a little bit more. So, um, so I, I take it that if I if I understood you correctly, some of the elements of Kirk's postmodernism were um, sort of a, a skepticism about totalizing narratives. A skepticism even about originality, you know, you said that he'd be glad not to have an original idea. Skepticism about um, sort of the, the cult of genius, maybe. And, and that has a lot of uh, connections to postmodernism in literary and cultural and artistic theory. Um, but then what interested me was you, you sort of said that the, the literature that he was actually interested in, people like T.S. Eliot, that seems like the opposite, right? And uh, and I, I doubt he would have been interested in people like Andy Warhol, though maybe he was. But that that seems to me more like representative of postmodern ideas in, in art. And so I'm I'm kind of you know wondering if you could talk about um, 
you know, these, this, this sort of postmodern view that he had of politics, you know, how do you, how do you think about art and literature and things like that? Well, I, th I think that's a good question. And uh, it, I think that he probably did not read a lot, if any, right, sort of serious postmodern work or even look at a lot of that kind of art. He did champion uh, a couple of artists whose work uh, was maybe not going to write in the formally in a postmodern school, but we're doing something beyond sort of what you might characterize or criticize him for liking sort of standards or classical art or whatever. But there, there's a, there's a um, painter whose name is escaping me who he wrote a wonderful essay on whose work is now being exhibited. Who He wrote that she paints chaos in search of order and her paintings are very much, uh, she's gone through a bunch of different stages, but part of it, her work was very much in that postmodern sort of uh, era, I would think. Um, but I would say this, I think that, that his, his use of these terms, I think, was more uh, uh, to make the point that now we could allow for a conservative imagination. He was less interested in the definitions or descriptions or waves of postmodernism. I think what he was saying is liberalism's imagination is exhausted, so now we've entered into this postmodern era where uh, something else could happen. And that might be a rediscovery of Eliot. And I think Eliot, he puts in a category, you know, yes, he wasn't a postmodern, but I think he, he, he attaches him to a revolutionary movement, rejecting the past movement in order to look for uh, the transcendent in contemporaneous, uh, his contemporaneous times, I think is how he would see Eliot. And so he, I think his writing about the postmodern says, now is the time for conservatives to do that. Who are the ones that are writing, painting, creating artwork that rejects that old liberal understanding and is trying to do something new. I don't think I think that he found his the people that he liked, you know, he liked Elliot, he liked Flannery O'Connor, he liked Ray Bradbury, um, he liked the work of Jerry Pornell, I don't know if you know that name as a science fiction author who's a friend of his. Uh, and that's probably about as far as he would go, uh, I think. Uh, but I think that his argument remains the same. And so I think that uh, as he was writing this stuff, I think it was clear, at least to me, reading it, that it was, he was relying on the next sort of younger, gen the rising generation, as he would call them, to try and find these new art forms or interpret that. And there are a lot of conservatives who actually like Warhol. Uh, and I actually think he was doing something very interesting. <laughs> that actually has come later. There's a, there's a recent piece about Warhol and um, his religious faith and how that informs his art. And so people are discovering this stuff. And I will say, do you know, the, do you know Klaus Rinn? I don't know. Uh, so he wrote uh, an essay where he calls Eliot the first postmodern for some uh, various reasons. So uh, people are, as with any, as any of you have written anything of any length, no, once you start researching, you see people picking up different ideas. And a couple of these have been picked up by more contemporary conservative writers. One more, Steve? Yes. Yeah. Just, I'm curious as to what is that, his views of the, the academic world is, because he sort of led, maybe I'm not summarizing it right, but he sort of, you lead with your heart and your mind follows which is sort of the opposite of what a lot of academic departments, like you know, sociology, political science in particular, where they're using a lot of mathematics to try to prove various um, theories or practices. I mean, did he have, did he, he, he rejected politics. That's not really what I'm interested in. Did he have a similar attitude towards universities? Or I, I think he did off and on. He, 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 when he got his doctor from St. Andrews, he came to teach at Michigan State. Uh, and then he got into a fight with its president. He thought the school was getting you know, too, too large, too undifferentiated, sort of too much in search of the next new thing rather than sort of, uh, regular academic work as he would describe it. So he left and he never really had after that a consistent teaching post. He had other fellowships here and there. But he was always a little bit, um, I would say, uh, at 90 degrees to academia. The University of Bookman, as I mentioned, the book review he founded, was founded to review textbooks. And so he did have a keen interest in how uh, students were being taught, um, I think for better or worse, although I think probably he was maybe a little bit more unfair to some of the more data-driven um, disciplines. I think that he um, was in general concerned that what passed for a lot of uh, academia, you know, sort, of, sort of a, a not surprising conservative lament, was sort of ideology of various kinds, and that we need to return to the, what he would call the humane learning. So he did. He 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 published in the University of Brooklyn. Lots of academics. You know, was on college campuses a lot. Spoke a lot. Uh, debated lots of other professors in the '60s and '70s. Uh, but always had that sort of lingering concern. Uh, I do think that he found uh, you know people like John Lukacs or others who were academics who were doing something that he found um, 
acceptable. That is merging their own academic discipline with what he saw as an imaginative effort to sort of inhabit whatever discipline they were trying to push forward. In a more historical sort of Western civilization type of education. Then. And that's just the right note to close on. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.